Um, and another thing that I'm talking about is about asynchronous um, environments or problems or tasks. And we have also seen that. And I think this is important because in many of the uh, approaches we are seeing, this is an alternate in discrete time thing. And I think that these asynchronous situations are important, especially I didn't do that because I thought the asynchronous is much more relevant than, non than asynchronous cases, but just because I didn't find a way to define difficulty properly in a synchronous situation, especially when you have an alternating action, percept, action, percept way. Let me just go into the details. Um, this is about uh, just the application of old ideas, uh, just we know the pieces, that's the usual step. We have been playing with the pieces for many years, and uh, at the end, you just combine in a way uh, these pieces, and you get to something relatively new, or at least you, you think you have solved a problem, or you're just uh, getting closer to that problem. Um, so, well, I will start with something very old. And uh, this is uh, Thurston's definition of ability. This can be applied to intelligence or to any other cognitive ability. And he just uh, gave this definition, and I like it very much. And instead of saying just an aggregation of performance, he just said, OK, the ability of an individual subject to perform a specified kind of task is a difficulty E at which the probability is one half that he will do that task. So, in order to uh, make this definition work, we need the notion of difficulty. Without that notion, this is nothing. Okay, so we need an, a difficulty function, and a difficult f function must have some kind of properties, and some of this is detailed in the paper if you're interested in. But typically, this doesn't have to be monotonic, but in the end, we want that as the task gets more difficult, we expect lower results from ages in general. If you find an agent that gets better with higher dif difficulties, your notion of difficulty is not correct. Okay? So that doesn't need to be monotonic, because that will make your things very difficult. But at least we would like something that goes to zero. In fact, if it goes to zero, you can even calculate the area and just can compare two assistants by just comparing this area according to the difficulties. That's a good approach, a nice approach. This is just borrowed from psychometrics. There's an area called uh, item response theory, they use it all the time. So it is, uh, it is not uh, um, a bad thing just to have a look at some psychometric uh, stuff uh, eventually. So, well, the problem about psychometrics, well, not the problem, the, the, the good thing about psychometrics, they have humans there, they just infer difficulties from a human population. That's easy. You just take an, a, a task and you just evaluate that on a, on, a, on a standardized population and you get how difficult each instance is. That's quite, well, relatively easy to do. And then you get your function and you, get, you use your function for all of this. The problem is we could just take an anthropocentric approach and say, okay, we, we, are, going just, we are going to borrow the def difficulty function from humans. That's one approach that's quite okay and you can do that. But instead, we can do otherwise. We can say, OK, can we just define a notion of difficulty that is not anthropocentric? Of course, this question has been around for many years. Um, so if you just look at any area, you will just see discussions about what's complex, what's difficult. It's about the task. It's about the actions that you do. It's about the complexity of the solution that you are just using for it is the same thing if you are talking about a single task instance or you are talking about the complete task problem or the general problem. Because 2 plus 2, you have the answer. The answer is 4. You don't need any extra. You, you, you can just uh, make do with a few bits for the solution. But if you want to um, code addition, there's a different stuff. Okay? Because you need an algorithm to perform all the, the possible. And typically, you also have uh, shortcuts. We don't apply the addition algorithm when we are given a, an addition for every possible case. We don't just we have many many cases that we just have in memory. So this the approach that we are going to have is just to analyze to the uh, complexity of the solution. Okay, not to, we don't need to have to look at all at the complexity of the environment or the task or the problem. So when we talk about 
difficulty, there's a, a thing that it is much easier to work with a qualitative notion of solution than a quantitative one. When you say, okay, the performance of this system is 0 0.7 and the performance of this other system is 20, and you have another task and performance has got have another range of values, you need to normalize, you want to compare two tasks, for instance. Or even instances, you can have that, if you want to aggregate that in an aggregate measure, you need to normalize all of that, and it is not easy to normalize all of that. So, it may be the case you have 10 tasks, and one task because just the magnitude is wider, even if you try to normalize that, because you need to normalize with a population of agents. So, it's not clear at all how you can combine several tasks into an aggregated task. There's always a problem about commensurability, okay? So instead of that, you just can put a threshold and define, okay, my task is just putting a threshold here and I'm just going to discretize that, the results. So I'm just talking about acceptable solutions and unacceptable solutions. With that, things simplify a little bit. And with that, we can just uh, consider a solution, a solution that is acceptable, that reaches that threshold, and then we just borrow the idea from um, uh, Levin's KT complexity, which is based on two uh, terms. The first term is the length of the policy or the solution, and then the uh, execution steps of the solution. We have to use that as an argument because it depends on the run on the stochastic uh, task, you may get more or less uh, execution steps. So this is not, uh, so that depends on the environment. So it's not like in a, a deterministic setting or just in a sequence, you just execute and program. So you, in a way you have an input and that depends on the input or the interaction. So well, this is more or less a motivation why we are using a synchronous task, but I think the point is you have a, a just action percept, action, percept, and you say, okay, how is my agent distributing its computation time? You say, okay, well, I can just calculate the maximum, and at this step, it used, let's say, 1,000 computational steps. So, well, this is worse than another, that at this point or another point, the maximum that uh, this system has used is 500 steps. But this is confusing because there can be another agent that just prepares some of its computation and just shares this computation in some other steps, so it is very easy to get confused about this. So instead of that, if you use a synchronous thing, you just think, okay, the system is going to use some steps, and when the system is not doing anything, the system can just go to sleep. This is a typical thing in asynchronous systems. So you can just sleep for a while, Another system will do some other things, but unrelated to the task is just like doing some kind of sleep or whatever. So in that way, it doesn't matter when you do the uh, computational steps. The, the important is, okay, I solve this task, I use some computational steps, this is what I'm going to measure, okay? And this can be done. Um, I don't mean that this is the only way, but I think for me, it's, it's the way I, I found. Well, I think that's uh, how we can uh, just formalize this. You can use probabilistic trivia machines and just add in a sleep instruction. Well, you don't get, you don't need to go to the uh, details, but it is, it is relatively simple to see that this can work. Um, so finally, we just uh, apply very old things to this uh, scenario, and we just define a new version of KT for interactive tasks, for asynchronous interactive set task in this way. So it is the classical uh, Levin's uh, KT uh, uh, adapted to this scenario. Um, one can argue is why don't we use, instead of the best solution, why don't we just use all the possible solutions and weigh them a la Solomonov in a way. Uh, well, that could be an option, but in the end, the difference is not going to be very high. So you can do it, if you are able to do it, you are going to need more resources to calculate dif difficulty, and I will be in favor of that option, but this is just a simplified approach, just looking at the, at the best solution, at the complexity of the best solution. Well, so another thing, well, I'm going to skip this because we only have 15 minutes, so you, if you're interested, in, I'm going to talk about task difficulty, but in the paper you also have some definitions about task instance difficulty, depending on the task. Okay, whether you ask, why is 2 plus 2 easier than, let's say, uh, 123 plus 87, for instance, which is not very difficult, but... Um, 
so well, you, there's some uh, something in the paper about that, and well, some uh, ugly formulas. Um, but I think another interesting thing about difficulty, apart from evaluation, this is the next thing I'm going to talk about, is that I think this was mentioned in the previous presentation, where you think about two tasks and you, and you wonder whether they are related or not, and this is not new at all. You can think, okay, let's think about the solution for the first task, or the best solution for the first task, the, be for the, first task, the best solution for the second task, and let's compare them. But it can happen that the, the, solution for, the best solution for the first task is very similar to the second best solution of the second task. So in a way, you can miss that there's a lot of common things. So another thing that you can do is just to see, in a way, how much the problem can be compressed if you put both things together. So if these two things are related, when you put them together, you're not going to get the sum of both difficulties. You're going to get this down a lot because as a common thing, the, the solution can just generalize from the two cases. So this is just common stuff. So, well, you can use, you have a good notion of difficulty, and that's something that we can discuss, uh, whether this is a good notion or a bad notion, but if you have a good notion of difficulty, you can use that to analyze uh, task similarity. Uh, well, so, why are we using KT? That's, well, I've started with that. And with uh, deterministic cases, when you only have sequential machines and all of that, we know that uh, Levin search uh, with a prefix to machines ensures a solution that is found in at most 2 to the L of P times S of P steps. Uh, if you just calculate the logarithm, you get Levin's KT. That's the reason why Levin's KT is so interesting. There is no chance that we have there. We use it because it includes time and it's a computable version of common complexity. I think it's much more than that. It's because it reflects the effort of searching for the solution and you have a bound of that. Okay, so the problem of our Levin search or the original Levin is not a problem. In this case, it works perfectly. It is, a, it is, a, it is an impressive result. Um, uh, the question is that when you have a stochastic task, you can never say that you have found the solution. Okay, that happens a lot of times in, in reinforcement learning and in other areas. You are not sure about the solution, so you have to keep trying. But in this search, you want to say, I, I just run this search and I need to stop when I think I have found the solution. You're never certain of that. So what you need to do is to put some kind of confidence level and say, okay, when I reach that confidence level, I stop because I have to stop. And then if I put a stop criterion, then I can measure how many computational steps that search is going to take. Um, so what we do is just uh, include the, uh, the, in this term, we call the, the, um, the, the time steps of, the, the computational steps of the solution times a number of repetitions that we need to repeat that to get a good estimation that the result that we're getting from the task is a good result, is, is well estimated. So there are many ways to do it, of doing this. In fact, here we're assuming that all of them take the same number of steps, which is not the case, but in a way we have, we have to approximate this in, in some way. And another assumption that we do in the paper is that uh, I assume a normal distribution for the, num the, the, the number of runs. I'm sure that some of you can come up with better solution, but this is, the, I think, a simple, and, and, and the interesting thing here is I just wanted to show very explicitly that as you would expect, and any statistician would expect, when you just have a high variance on your execution for that task, and you are very close to the threshold, you have to do a lot of repetitions in order to be sure that you have found the solution. Okay, so that's clear, and you, we see that very clear in this formula. You can just come up with other formulas. Another thing that I wanted to see is that this term, when we apply this, um, uh, we, when we calculate the difficulty, since we are applying a logarithm, this is a constant, or, sorry, it's not a constant term, it's an additive term, <laughs> So in a way, uh, after all of this, you could say, well, the repetitions that you need, depending on how sure you are of that, are important, but perhaps the most important term in the sum is still the length of your policy. Okay, so we're still talking about compression, simple solutions, and all of that. 
So, well, that's it basically, and I think that difficulty is a key concept when we're talking about cognitive evaluation and intelligence evaluation in, in particular, and, and um, there are some notions that can be derived from that, so it, it can be used for some other uh, things. Of course, about difficulty, everyone has uh, uh, their opinion, but uh, I think that looking at the solution complexity, I think, is the right way to go. And, um, well, this is just um, a, a rough approximation, and, of course, this can be done better, but I, I, I just wanted to just to, to write a, a version of Levin search for these cases and something simple that I could apply if I want to just to, to get some kind of or measure of difficulty of a general problem. And that's it. As for those of you who weren't here yesterday, uh, next year um, there will be a, a new book. It's not about the singularity, and, uh, but it's about uh, things like evaluation in the general setting. Well, for those of you who were here yesterday, you know. Um, if someone is interested, as I told yesterday, uh, I'm reading a, a draft. It's, uh, it's going to be finished in about, hope, in about a couple of months. And so, and that's it. I'm the next one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry for the monotonicity. Okay, this is about evaluation. We are in a session about evaluation, but this is about a quite different thing and with a quite different approach. Uh, in fact, this is uh, the work of my PhD student, uh, Javier Insa. And uh, four years ago, uh, we had a meeting, the kind of meeting that you have with um, your students when they're just looking for a topic, and I said, well, I think the next step, if you don't include social things, you can talk about the intelligence, but it, this, is, this is incomplete. So we need to, to have something about social intelligence. And the problem was that, is social intelligence a different thing from general intelligence? Is it part of it? And you just have a look at psychometrics, human intelligence, and all of that, and you see the, the, and you, then you move to multi-agent systems, which is a, high, a hot topic in, in artificial intelligence in the past 20 years or so. You see also the social, this, in fact, you look at, when you talk with some classical AI guy, and say, what's the, 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 the most relevant change in the past 20 years? Well, you could say, well, uh, deep learning, learning is much more important than it was, and all of that, but some other people could say that because we are thinking in a social way because of these multi-agent systems and all of that. Well, I'm not an agent, a multi-agent system guy, so don't be worried. Um, but social intelligence is important, and we wanted to, uh, to do something about that from the point of view of evaluation. So is this being evaluated in the right way? Can we do it better, or can, can we do it at all? Um, so these were the questions, and at this point of the process, and many, many pathways were just uh, explored and, and, and left uh, abandoned. But this was one of the pathways that we have just pursued. And at the end, what we have done is just to analyze uh, a test bed, let's say something like the, um, you have a, a, a set of tasks and you say that these tasks are useful to measure social intelligence or social abilities. So you don't want to use the term intelligence. And you say, why? Is it true? Can, I, can we evaluate the evaluator in a way? Okay. So, well, we tried to define some kind of specifications, and I think in the previous, in the first presentation, that word was specifications that these test beds should have in order to really evaluate social, and nothing more and nothing less. And I think that's a problem. Okay. So we finally came out with a, a set of properties. Of course. Uh, We've changed these properties along the way, and we are not completely happy of all of them, but I think this is the first approach uh, about uh, these properties. I'm not going to show the formulas, they are very big. 
you have some of them in the papers, you have some of them um, uh, oh, I lost something. Uh, no, uh, you have them here if you are interested, or you, uh, and in the paper you only have some of them, okay? But you have the reference in the paper where the others are explained. Um, well, so let's start with uh, social intelligence. Uh, typically, uh, we need some other agents there but that's not a, 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 a necessary condition that we are going to have something social. You can put a lot of agents there and nothing happens about social intelligence because there's no interaction, whatever. So um, there are some people that have studied this from the point of view of complexity of the agents and how the, the intelligence of the other agents is relevant to have a social in, uh, a scenario. So you put random agents in your scenario, probably you're not going to have any social interaction. So it depends on the other agents. That, that's a key point. Um, and another question, as I mentioned, is how uh, social and general uh, intelligence can be distinguished. And, and, that's a, and that's a question that is not easy to, to answer. And so, well, that's what we try uh, to do, is to define some uh, criteria. And first, we just set a, a multi-agent system, a classical approach. So here, we didn't uh, go to asynchronous cases and all of that. So basically, the, the usual step, but stuff. But we, in some uh, uh, or in many papers in uh, artificial intelligence, you see about alliances and coalitions, how they are created. But I think if you read these papers, everything is preset when you start. So these agents are just dev these devised to create coalition. It's not something that just comes up uh, from just the interaction. You can just build a, an agent and the, the, the possibility of creating alliances and coalitions, especially if you're not using communication, I think the probability is, is very, very low, if, if, if any. So we just work with teams, which is a quite typical thing in AI as well. You just are used to games and things like that. You have one team, another team. You have Robocop, for instance, as a, as a good platform for evaluating agents. You have two teams. So I think that was the approach, but of course we, would, uh, we wanted to generalize that a little bit. So we just uh, started with a definition. Um, uh, well, a, a very nice one, which is just a sum of a lot of things and then a lot of distributions, as usual. You have to put a set of agents with a distribution, a set of environments with a distribution, and then a distribution of slots. Where do you put each uh, player depending, so you, with the same uh, players or with the same uh, agents and the same game, changing just the positions, you can have a different uh, result. So, and you also may want to give probabilities or a probability distribution to these possibilities. So a goalkeeper, is it going to play as a mid uh, field uh, player? And so these things. So, well, I think the um, um, I've mentioned that the ability of opponents is key, but also the ability of teammates, especially we are just interested in uh, measuring whether there's kind of competitive versus cooperative social intelligence. And these things appear very soon in, in, in multi-agent systems. You see this, and one thing is to be uh, social intelligent in a competitive way, and another thing is to be social intelligent in a cooperative way. And how are these two abilities uh, related and all of that. So, so all of these things are extremely complicated unless someone said, no, no, this is easy, I have a solution. Um, but I don't think it is the case. Um, so what we did is a series of uh, cri um, criteria to determine whether a test bed, which is an evaluation tool, is able to measure social things, social abilities accurately. So we just came up with a series of um, properties. Some of them are uh, specifically about social things, and some others are more instrumental about whether the measurement instrument is doing something reasonable. Okay, so something like the typical ones are reliability and validity, but we needed some other ones that the, the, the measurement is efficient, efficient and all of that. We have given definitions for all that. These definitions 
are not definite as, as, as they never were because we have changed them in the past year or so several times, but I think this is the first approach. And well, I don't know how much time I have, so. Huh? 10 minutes, okay, so well, we can go through some of them. I'm not going to show the formulas, it, you can find them. Uh, but basically the ideas of it. Um, so when we start with social properties, we talk about interactivity, so that means roughly, and the problem is how to measure that. So for that you need to go to the definitions to see whether we did everything wrong or we did something that is close to this idea. Whether you include other different agents that make some effect on the actions that the evaluated agent uh, does. If you put some other agents and it, they, these uh, agents don't affect at all at what you're doing and you're being evaluated, they, well, this is not social at all because you are not caring at all about the other agents. That happens all the time. You just put an, a multi-agent, you just put some agents and they're going to ignore each other because basically we don't have agents with theories of mind that we're just not even able to recognize the other agents. That depends on the, uh, on the environment or that you're using, uh, et cetera. Another thing borrowed from ecology is uh, what we call non-neutralism, which is a simplification of these uh, six forms of symbiosis in ecology, where you have neutralism, whether you benefit from the other, you, un you, you compete with the other, so whether, uh, so uh, the rewards of the other uh, affect you or or not, so you can have positive-positive, uh, you can have negative-negative, so there's a competition there. So in, in the end, what we did was just to simplify this a little bit, and we talk about neutralism, there's no uh, um, interaction or effect between the rewards of one uh, agent and the other, cooperation and competition. So with that, um, we introduced that, that property, and then we just disting distinguish two things. One is competitive anticipation. Probably these two are very difficult to define in a good way, but we try some approximation. So that means, um, uh, is the agent going to improve uh, its results if the agent is able to anticipate what the other agents are doing? Okay, so basically this is anticipation. That's very difficult to measure. But well, we tried in a way, or we tried to evaluate whether this uh, benchmark does something like that. So um, um, the idea is just to compare to a random agent and then to compare to other agents and see that it, to see whether there's a change uh, between just having some rather random agents that you cannot anticipate compared to other agents that you can or supposedly you would be able to anticipate, or the best agent would be anticipated. If there's that difference that you can say, okay, this benchmark can, if you would have, or you had a, a, a good agent, that the agent could profit for the anticipation or, or anticipating the other agents. But maybe many benchmarks you just realize that this is not possible, independently of what agent you put. And some of these are just say to measure or to be, be, be related to social intelligence. You can see this because we have teams, you can see this in, in terms of competitive or cooperative anticipation. Then another thing is discrimination. Um, so this is not a social thing, this is a general thing. We want uh, that the, when we evaluate, we give different values to different agents or agents that behave differently. Okay, we just, gave roughly the same value to all, then this is not, uh, this, this test bed is not discriminative enough, okay? We can have, for instance, we can have a very nice total order of all the agents, just, make it, just saying that all agents are exactly the same, okay? So uh, one trick of getting good properties is just to put everything together, but we want to have some kind of discrimination that doesn't have to be uh, a, a, a strict total order, in fact, it is never or almost never the case. But we wonder that you see that you have different values and these, man these values are meaningful and meaningful in this way. Uh, how many times you have this? Okay, that if A is worse than B, B is worse than C, you have that A is worse than C. You can have exceptions, but what we measure is how many times you have that, depending on the population of agents and that. 
And some other more instrumental, you have the definition in the, in the paper, we want the rewards to be bounded, that's quite easy. And instead of uh, talking about um, uh, uh, zero-sum games in game theory, we talk about zero-sum teams, which is basically an extension to teams of the classical idea. And then an interesting property is not necessary, but is quite useful is symmetry. For instance, in, in football, goalkeepers must be very different from the other players. In fact, they have different actions. Or can, they can do different actions. So you want to just to evaluate agents, uh, start with something that you don't have different positions, because otherwise it's going to be very complicated. Oh, this is good for this position, but this is bad for the other position. Why, why don't we just take games that we don't have different positions? Um, and then we have the classical stuff, uh, reliability, efficiency. Um, these are more or less defined in the classical way from any measurement uh, device. And then validity, of course this is a key issue. And th the idea is, and uh, is the test bed uh, giving good results to systems that are not social? and it is giving bad results to systems that are social. I think this is a key question, and, this, and the problem of validity is, in this case, you cannot give, or you cannot fully formalize that, because you don't have a previous definition of social intelligence. So at this point, the validity, as in many other evaluations, is, is more subjective. But in any, in, in any case, we just get, uh, try to, uh, to um, work with an approximation, and we just analyzed five uh, um, environments, multi-agent uh, environments. Some of them are very, uh, very well known. Um, some of them with any slots. And we just um, calculate the ranges of the properties for uh, these uh, five environments. So this is one, two, three, four, five for each of the properties. So this, this slide and this slide. Um, you don't have this in the paper, but you have this in, in some of the links here. Uh, well, what we see is that many of them are similar, except for some cases, because we were just calculating that with all possible agents. You calculate that with all possible agents, you can have the worst evaluation test possible, and you can have the best evaluation uh, test, depending on this set of agents that you use as opponents and uh, collaborators, okay, in your team. So was it, that was expected. But what we saw is that some of them didn't have very good properties or didn't have any, for instance, cooperation at all. It was the matching pennies and the prisoner dilemma. Um, even if you may think that this is one of the examples of, of, of cooperation, um, because the other one is in the other team, so it's, it's a different perspective. That's the reason why we have a, a, a zero there. And then the instrumental properties, which are yes or no. Uh, we found, found more diversity here, and especially in efficiency. Some of them you can have a, a, a reliable, uh, 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 for when you do many trials. And well, this is just a way of looking at, at it. So uh, just to uh, finish, uh, this is the first approach. I think that the, well, uh, it took us uh, a little bit just to see all the uh, different notions of social abilities, social intelligence from different areas, just to see what, what the people in multi-agent systems considered and the people in, let's say, in, in, in human intelligence or even in animal intelligence. And you see that these things are not compatible. And in a way, we just we try to derive some properties this is not going to be definitive at all, but I think it's the first step, and uh, I think we have learned during this, these three, four years, especially the student, I hope. And that's it.